This time, the paths of history take us far, to the coasts of the Mediterranean, where we are embraced by the wise biblical East. The small Mediterranean country encompasses a great number of archaeological sites and presents an extraordinary cultural synthesis of the East and the West. Lebanon is uniquely situated at the crossroads of three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. An Arab poet, glorifying the beauties of Lebanon, wrote, He bears winter on his head, spring on his shoulders, fall on his breast, and summer at his feet. Indeed, the East is a subtle thing. Suddenly, you find yourself wondering about many things. Is this vast sky over the east any different? Does the sun shine differently? Where does life start and where does it end? Here, people sought immortality in their endless quest for the Creator. It is the birthplace of sermons of truth, love, and eternal life. The three greatest world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, originated in the Middle East. Some 3,000 years BC, at the dawn of the written history, on the shores of present-day Lebanon, there lived a Semitic-speaking people who called themselves Canaanites. Canaan is the earliest known name of the area once uniting today's Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine. It was this very people that the Greeks called Phoenicians. relationship exists among Kenyanites, Amoretis, Assyro-Babylonians, Jews, and Arabs. It is also confirmed that Kenyanites had built a temple dedicated to Baal, a pagan deity of fertility. Baalbek, the name of the widely known site, is derived from this deity. Following the occupation of Phoenicians, the Romans erected three marvelous temples to Bacchus, Jupiter, and Venus there. In the Greek tradition, Baalbek was known as Heliopolis, the city of the sun. The Bible describes the Phoenicians as gifted carpenters and ivory carvers. The Phoenician land was fertile but small. Thus, those inhabitants, lacking an opportunity at farm life, chose other venues earning a reputation as world-renowned sailors and merchants.
Situated 37 kilometers north of Beirut, Bibelos Jebel is one of the oldest cities in the world. According to historians, it is the most ancient among continuously inhabited ones. It is the birthplace of the Phoenician alphabet, which served as a foundation for many modern alphabets. This is where the Phoenician trading ships set sail to conquer the Mediterranean Sea. This small piece of land carries numerous traces of many civilizations. Who were these people? Where are they now? Time can create and destroy, but can it preserve? This cliff is an exception when time can also preserve. An ordinary rock at first sight, it is full of history. A survivor through the centuries, it has waged millennium-long battles with sea winds to preserve these relics of human history. Here is the rock of the visiting cards with a wide range of inscriptions dating from the times of Ramses to when the last French soldier left Lebanon. Each striving to leave their mark by stamping an inscription of their victory upon it, from Ramses to Zina Karib, a Sahardan, and Nebuchadnezzar, down to Alexander the Great, Marcus Aurelius, and on to Caracalla, the Crusaders, Saladin, and many others. Let us stop at the stele which provides a witness to the former greatness and the glorious existence of the Assyrian Empire on this earth. Some Assyrian estele still display their vague, cuneiform characters, but in the great struggle of the time, these exceptional pieces of history are slowly surrendering to the wind and the salty climate of the region. Conquering Phoenicia in the 9th century, the Assyrians put an end to the Phoenician trade monopoly over the Mediterranean and established the Assyrian domination in that sphere. The Assyrians' records on this stela pertain to that period. Still visible, carved upon the arch structure, lies the profile of the Assyrian king. He symbolizes a foreign figure with a raised hand and a sword. This depiction, yet again, attests to the Assyrian hegemony over this territory. Also depicted on the estele are the number of symbols placed in front of the Assyrian conqueror. With the aggravation of the Christian theological polemics, the struggle between various Christian denominations and its adherents intensified in the early medieval East. In the whirlwind of history, the rugged Lebanese mountains have been a constant refuge for members of religious minorities seeking to flee from persecution. 
Such religious exiles turn to these mountains as a shelter to preserve their traditions and establish churches in the impregnable highlands. Fleeing persecution, a Syrian monk, Maran Anakorite, a great example of monastic lifestyle of Eastern Christianity, sought refuge in Lebanon. Saint Maron is believed to be the founder of the Maronite Church. A cliff hangs over the legendary Orontes River, where the remnants of the rock-hewn monastery still exist. Historians believe this is to be a 5th century shrine erected in the times of savage persecution of Christians. Here is the main hall, which apparently featured something resembling a staircase, presumably leading to the cells situated above. Tradition has it that it sheltered St. Marin, the Monothelite Syrian monk, and his supporters. It was considered that the Maronites preserved monothelism for some time. What is monothelism? It's an attempt to conciliate two different directions in Christianity, monophysites and Nestorians. Nestorians laid the emphasis on the human nature of Jesus Christ without denying his divine nature, although they believed in separate existence of both his natures. Monophysites underlined Christ's divine nature. There was an attempt to reconcile them. There was an opinion about divine and human natures of Jesus Christ unified with one will. That's monothelism. We have a few testimonies that some Maronite theologians most likely inclined toward Jacobites, that is, toward monophysites, who stressed the divine nature of God. But in some points, they were closer to Nestorians. First of all, as the Maronite priests maintain, a part of their vestment looks like the Nestorian one. On the other hand, they have Syriac as common language. The Maronites used it either in Aramaic form or in Edessan dialect. These are the common Oriental Christian backgrounds, and no matter how much the Maronites later became Latinized, their Eastern Christian background is maintained and is proudly recalled by them. The Maronite Church today, maintaining the principles of the Eastern Rites and the formal patriarchal leadership, is in communion with the Roman Catholic Church and is one of the influential churches in the modern Middle East. The Marionites, together with the Greek Melkites Catholics, make up 90% of the total population of Lebanon. Beirut is one of the ancient cities in the world inhabited since the Paleolithic era. Once famed as the Paris of the Middle East, it is indeed the glamorous pearl of the Eastern Mediterranean. Even the carnage of civil war could not diminish the magnificence of the Lebanese capital.
Beirut lies on the slopes of high mountains enclosing the city in a semicircle. The areas of land featuring buildings with diverse architectural styles terrace down the mountains in disorderly rows. Narrow winding streets snake their way to the sea, frequently crossing the wide highway afloat. With an endless stream cars with yellow and red lights blinking at night. Beirut is located on a ledge, penetrating into a gulf of St. Gregory. As the legend goes, this is the place where a ferocious dragon came out of the water and wished to claim the Princess of Beirut as a sacrifice. This is when St. Gregory speared the dragon, thus protecting the princess. The seafront is the most beautiful part of Beirut, the heart of the capital life. Everything here is connected with water as the source of life and the means of communication. Indeed, the sea trade has for centuries been the main occupation of Lebanese people. Magnificent Christian cathedrals of various denominations majestically adorn the landscape overlooking the city of Beirut. Lebanon is the only region in the East where Christian shrines, serving as beacons of faith, have endured for hundreds of years. These edifices testify to the birth and emergence of a new religion, and they preach of a new sweeping ideology born at the threshold of the Orient. The crosses erected over them are powerful symbols of the Christian pledge to conserve the faith. At the time when Lebanon declared its independence, the Christians here comprised 51.1% and the Muslims 44.9% of the population. Back then, these demographics translated into a corresponding political power structure that reserved many high-ranking positions, including the presidential office for the Christians, Marianites in particular. Today, the population ratio has changed considerably in favor of the Muslims. Beirut is divided into two parts, Christian and Muslim. Among the Christian communities of Lebanon, the Marionites are the biggest, followed by Melkites, Orthodox Greeks, Orthodox and Catholic Armenians, Orthodox Syrians, Assyrians of the Old Church of the East, Catholic Syrians, Chaldeans, and Syrian Protestants. In the first half, of the 20th century, a number of Christian survivors of the 1915 genocide, perpetuated at the hands of the Ottoman Empire, 
made their way to Lebanon. Barely clinging to life, these refugees founded communities in Lebanon that even to this day center on their particular Christian faiths. All community members associate their national identity with the Christian sect to which they belong. Thus, a sense of national identity is derived from the adherence to the particular Christian doctrine. In early Christian centuries, religion took a primary position in the lives of people, while their own tribe and neighbors occupied a secondary place. We know that these people knew several languages, but did not identify any of them as their native tongue. It was not of much significance to them. It is true that there is a unified origin of Eastern Christianity, but further away from the center, local understandings grew more in contrast to the official religion. There were both Nestorianism and Monophysitism, which included various ethnic groups. It all practically became reduced to ethnic irrelevance and intensified the importance of the particular faith. It's quite another matter that these cultural religious peculiarities created what scholars call ethno-denominational groups. That is, when the ethnic, denominational, cultural, and the genetic interflow into something indissoluble. Such facts render it difficult to determine the nationality of a certain community. To this end, we are faced with not only the necessity of taking a scholarly approach, but also to honor the local sense of identity within these communities, which is of equal importance. In a theological sense, it is the common liturgical language that binds together the Orthodox Syrians, the Assyrians of the Old Church of the East, and the followers of the Marianite Church. This linguistic bond exists despite the fact that Arabic has become dominant in Marianite liturgy. <laughs> Assyrians in Beirut live on the outskirts of the capital. Here is the Assyrian quarter. Its location is obvious by looking at this trilingual sign. Nestled in a tightly wound mesh of apartment buildings, houses and shops, the Assyrian quarter is not so different from other parts of this vast city. Only the architectural complex of Mar Givargis and Assyrian flags occasionally flying in the breeze reveal the presence of the Assyrian population. The church of Mar Givargis is the residence of Mar Nasai, the metropolitan of the Assyrian church of the east.
The courtyard hosts the secondary school, which functions under the auspices of the Lebanon Diocese of the Assyrian Church of the East. The school strictly follows the state guidelines in secondary school programs, but where the curriculum includes the study of the mother tongue. The school started its mission in 1969 with about 300 students who were taught Arabic, French, and Assyrian. Originally founded as a primary school offering a five-year education, today its students receive a nine-year education program. Classes for children of preschool age are also available. The school welcomes not only Assyrian children, but also those of other Christian communities and even Muslims. We start from age three, which means kindergarten, until the ninth grade. Each grade has only one class. This year, the total number of students is 150. The number was greater before because the Assyrian population was greater. After the end of the war, the doors opened and the people scattered far and dwelled in other places. As the population dwindled, the number of students dwindled too. But thanks to God, it is satisfactory so far. In the mother tongue, Assyrian, they read the Bible and the Psalms for the higher grades, and there are reading and grammar books starting from the first grade and up. Then, after the fourth grade, they begin to study Bible and so on. This school belongs to the church. We don't receive any help from the government. Most of the finances come from the community. Many modern Assyrians moved to Lebanon long before World War I. They were migrants of the Ottoman Empire, from the region of Turabdin, cities of Mardin, Diyarbakir. After World War I, the Assyrians from the city of Urfa in Turkey also settled in Lebanon. Today, their descendants, 30 families representing the Syrian Evangelical Church, live in the Assyrian Quarter immigrants from Urfa, that is how the members of the evangelical community are called. Remarkably, the spoken language of these people was Armenian. Many of them still speak it. The Assyrian settlement goes back to thousands of years ago to the time of Assyrian Empire. But the new waves of migration began after the genocide against our people during the First World War when the refugees from Tur Abdin and Mardin come to settle in Lebanon. There was a great number of the Assyrians from the Church of the East who came to Lebanon with Malik Kambar and settled in Zahle. Another group came to Lebanon after the massacre of 1933 in Simel, Iraq. The Assyrian immigration from Lebanon began in the year 1975. Of course, the Assyrians are not the only ones who migrate out of the country. There are also other Christian people of Lebanon who leave their country because of special atrocities against them. It is because of the existing situation that many people choose to leave their country. But the migration of Assyrians is greater than others because they don't have a country of their own and are not bound to the land where they live as strangers. We have to add financial problems to what makes the younger generations migrate to other places in the world. For example, the number of members of the Assyrian Church of the East was over 20,000 during the 1940s and 1950s, but nowadays their number is reduced to less than 8,000. Another close-knit Assyrian community exists in the region of Baabda, a suburb of Beirut. It has an Assyrian church of the east named in honor of St. Python.
through discussion and dialogue, the priest of the church plays an important role in revitalizing traditional national and religious values in the lives of the young people. Such guidance, while strengthening a sense of national identity, also hinders the process of assimilation into the greater Lebanese society. After the bloody events of 1933, when the Iraqi government destroyed the Assyrian settlements and slaughtered their population in northern Iraq, the majority of these Iraqi Assyrians had to abandon their homes. A part of them found a new home in Lebanon. <laughs> Givargis Yonatan Givargis is 80, the long and winding road of anguish and pain stretching from Iraq to Syria and on to Lebanon is forever etched into his mind. It has been a rough journey, and unfortunately, his nation continues to suffer. Like other Christian communities of Lebanon, the Syrians were forced to join the civil war that took place in the 1970s, which mainly had a religious character. Reaping a harvest of huge material and emotional carnage, it shattered the stability of the whole region and turned the lives of so many people upside down. Since the war, many Christians, including Assyrians, have left the country in the hope of finding greater security and economic opportunity. For numerous Iraqi Assyrian expatriates. Lebanon also serves as a place of asylum and transit to the West. The refugees in Lebanon today number around 2,000. However, since the war in Iraq, some 5,000 refugees have made their way to the West through Lebanon. They are mainly Assyrians from Baghdad. The members of the Syriac Orthodox Church live comfortably in this part of the capital, Beirut. Among the winding streets and tall buildings that still bear the scars of the Civil War, 
There is a sign on a large building pointing to an educational institution. Tau Mim Simket. The school of the Syriac Orthodox Church has been repeatedly relocated during its long history. Originating at the turn of the century by Assyrians who took refuge in New York and New Jersey to care for and educate Assyrian orphans of persecution. This building was built by the Assyrian National School Association in 1927. It remained in operation until 1973, when the school moved to another larger and more modern facility in Burj Hamoud. There it still stands proudly today. The first school of the Assyrian Orphanage and School Association opened in Adana, Turkey in 1919 and closed in 1921. This year, 2005-2006, Assyrian language was taught to 240 students. While an optional subject for non-Assyrians, it is mandatory for Assyrian students and is taught in all grades. The community lives its everyday life. People attend church, celebrate Christian holidays, and actively participate in the life of the community and the church. These young people belong to the youth group. They came here to discuss certain issues and get an assignment. The Syriac Orthodox Church of Mor Yaqub. It is the residence of George Saliba, Beirut's Metropolitan of the Syrian Orthodox Church of Antioch. He voiced concerns over the challenge of preserving the mother tongue. In fact, since a considerable part of the congregation does not understand Syriac, the church has had to conduct the liturgy in both Syriac and Arabic. This in part has been an outcome of the growing number of mixed marriages. The Syrian Orthodoxy came here to Lebanon in the 20th century. They first came to Zahle. They started to build churches and schools and everything. After the First World War, a great number of our people came to this country because of the persecution and hardship in Beth Nahrin, especially in Turabdin in Turkey. They came to Beirut after World War I, meaning 1914. Later, they built the Church of Putros Polus in Beirut and the Church of St. George in Zahle. Here, in the Mount of Beirut in 1973, there was only one bishopric in Lebanon. In the course of time, the body of the church separated into three bishoprics, namely the bishopric of Beirut, Zahle, and the Mount of Lebanon, each under one metropolitan. I am the metropolitan for the church of the Mount of Lebanon. This young couple starts a new family today. Aside from the joy of this event, everyone is also happy because the community is becoming richer by one family. The people present at the ceremony wish them happiness, many children, and commitment to the faith and traditions of their ancestors. Among the significant Christian organizations functioning in Lebanon is the Syriac League. It started its activities in 1975 as an advocate for the Assyrian people in Lebanon. From their comfortable office in the heart of Beirut, various programs are planned and launched. Updates and information are posted on their official website. The main goal of the Syriac League is to stem the tide of migration by encouraging the Assyrian community to stay in Lebanon. To this end, programs have been devised to assist people in finding jobs and to provide social and financial assistance. They have launched programs to eradicate illiteracy, 
to teach computer skills, Syriac language, English literature, and social affairs. Uh, I would consider that the Syriac League in Lebanon is the major party or organization that takes care not only uh, for the Syriac as a community, but for the rights of all the uh, Christian minorities in Lebanon, that uh, is the Syriac Orthodox, Syriac Catholic, Assyrian, or uh, the Church of the East, and the Chaldeans, and the Copts for this purpose. We try to be the front of all the issues concerning our people. We are part of the union of the uh, Christian leagues. We are uh, part and uh, members of the Syriac Universal Alliance. Uh, our organization uh, that has excellent relations with the church uh, try to implement in our people the feeling of identity, of belonging, uh, not only deep inside the history, but regarding the future. This is the city of Zahale, in the eastern part of Lebanon. It calls itself home to many followers of the Greek Catholic Church. The suburbs of the city boast many vineyards, and the people of Zahale are known as accomplished winemakers. A Russian journalist covering the bloody events during the troubled times of the Civil War in Lebanon wrote a book titled At the Gates of the East, where he mentions an Assyrian priest he had met in the city of Zahale. In the heat of the working day, a strange visitor opened the door of my room. It was a tall old man with a gray beard clad in a black cassock, who in clear Russian introduced himself as Father Alexandros. It turned out that he was a priest from the region of Zahale, where a small Assyrian community lived under his wing. We are in Zahale. The son of the late priest Alexandros shared his memories recounting the story of his father and the thorny past of his nation. He explained why and how his family abandoned the Hakari region and found shelter in Lebanon. David Isha Yonin Alexandros. Each of his three names represents a generation of his respected family. خزمانا ناشا من نجل ويدي انتي وطاما خير غزيلة انو مرخم مش الشتشن جوجي شو ريلة بجا بخلواي قو برانساوي ساوي وخلواي ودا وبيبابي بيباب الداي هي اللي اللخة هي اللي غزيلة اخا دشتا غزيلة ايوا ماشينا اخا ايوا تايشن شيتت اسري و اتكسر اسري أمري هي سي هي بالخلطة يا أخي أطرد لبنا نجو أخا زيلة روله بسلاقاو سرت الجيل وخلا واستنسى ماشينا وخايط وخيس بي وراهت هي لش هي اللي قلنا وهي اللي هي اللي لا خساوي بيا وبرخ مرماني مسكينة مثل برخ ماشينا. Written in Nestorian script, this book reflects the history of an entire clan from the Marzaya settlement of Hakari's Jello Ashirat. It was a clan of priests and Maliks fated to scatter throughout the world bearing in their hearts the weight of the atrocious tragedy and a longing for their homeland. The fate of this one family is echoed in the appalling fate suffered by the whole nation. The Ottoman Turkey, 1915. Genocide, violations, deportations, Alexandro's family, having miraculously escaped the Turkish Yatakhan, along with a few others, 
had to relentlessly seek refuge on the way from Hakkari to Van, then to Erivan and eastern Armenia, and on to Russia. Many of the fellow members of the clan vanished during the large-scale deportation. Only a handful headed by Malik Kamber settled in Zahale. This is Ksara village, where they live now. The large Mar Zaya church built with the support from Ksara Assyrians, living in diaspora, rises at the center of the village. It is a homage to the legendary shrine of Marzaya, abandoned in the village by the same name in Hakari. Over the past years, large numbers of Assyrians have emigrated to Europe, America, and Australia. On Christian holidays, the church still gets crowded, but the flock thins out day by day as more Assyrians leave the village to make a better life. It is said that in the East, people still cling to their national identity and traditions. Nevertheless, with time, the assimilation is inevitable even here. Beirut. We are at the school of Margibargis. This is an Assyrian language lesson. The school plays a vital role as the instrument through which a sense of cultural self-awareness is instilled in the younger generations from an early age. As long as the school exists, this language and culture will endure. This young Maronite boy demonstrating his knowledge of Assyrian and the children around him are a vivid proof that almighty time cannot wipe this people off the face of the earth. These kids studying the Assyrian language are the future and the hope of the community and the nation. As long as their lips utter words in their mother tongue, the community will survive. So will the nation.